tonight to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 17 and 18. Uh, and that's a tall order. We got a lot to cover. Uh, we're coming near the end of our journey through the book. And uh, we've got a lot uh, we're going to read. It's a lot of narrative. You know, when I say narrative, it's just a historical account. Uh, so we'll read a lot. We'll talk a little. And uh, these are not difficult concepts to grasp. And yet there's a lot of application to make as we look at the book. And, uh, you know, when we, when we, with the death of Samson, we came to the last judge. Uh, you will not see another judge mentioned in the book. Uh, just remember that the term judge means deliverer or savior. And what, we, what we've seen is this. There's no human deliverer, no human savior that is sufficient. Every single one of them fell short of, of ultimately what God had planned and purposed. And so we look forward. When we finish the book of Judges, we're still looking, right? We're still looking for an ultimate savior, an ultimate deliverer, and that's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, as we come to chapter 17, really through the end of the book, uh, these are what we would call the appendix of the book. You remember uh, at the initial outset, and in chapters 1 and 2, there was kind of a double introduction. Chapter 1 gave us an introduction, and chapter 2 repeated that. Well, and, and uh, we're going to do the same thing as we end the book. There's going to be a double appendix. And so we'll see the initial in chapter 17 and 18 tonight. And then in, verses, in chapters 19 to 21, we'll finish it up. Uh, and it, these are not chronological. So as we come to this point in the book, we're not immediately following the death of Samson, um, most likely what we're about to read took place well before the Philistine oppression, that 40 years where Samson was a judge, uh, just because the events that are taking place would not have been able to happen under Philistine oppression. And so uh, this is not necessarily, again, chronological order. The, the whole purpose really behind these last few chapters is to give us a picture of what life was like in Israel during the time of the judges. And I'm going to warn you, things are about to get pretty ugly, right? Particularly when we finish up next week, uh, chapter 17 and 18 really centers around uh, a Levitical priest uh, who we'll find out the identity of at the end. Uh, and, and so we're going to begin with a man named Micah. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for just the, the privilege again it is to be able to come into your house and to worship you and to sing your praises and Lord, uh, we thank you for the testimonies that we heard tonight. Lord, uh, you're so faithful. And Lord, we're, you're working in the hearts and lives of your people. And Lord, just uh, we are confident that you who have begun a good work will complete it. I thank you for that promise. And Lord, as we come to your word again, I pray that you would accomplish your purpose. Lord, we, our heart's desire is just to see more of Christ and, and to, to love you more. And I pray that you would speak and... Lord, certainly that you would get me out of the way, as always. Lord, I know that apart from Christ that I can do nothing. And Father, our heart's desire is just to, to lift you up and to exalt the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask it tonight in Jesus' name, and amen. So we come to Judges 17 in verse 1, and it simply says, There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. You know, the tribe of Ephraim is kind of right in the center of Israel. As you're reading the book of Judges, and if you're studying it for yourself, <coughs> it's really helpful if you have an atlas that you can look at, you know, a map. So if you've got you know, maps in the back of your Bible, or if you have a Bible atlas that you can go and refer to, uh, sometimes it's really helpful. And so here we find Ephraim kind of dead center in, in the midst of Israel in the midst of, of the land of promise, and in this land, you know, and Ephraim's been a, pro, a pretty prominent tribe as we went through the book of Judges. They've been someone, they've been a military power. They've come to the aid of one judge after another, and they've kind of been a, a tribe who sought glory, right? They were glory seekers. They wanted, and so many times they were saying, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you let us in on it? But it's in the midst of this tribe that we find this man named Micah, whose name literally means who is like Yahweh? It's a, it's a rhetorical question. How would you like to have that for a name? <laughs> a rhetorical question. Uh, and that's what it is. And the answer is nobody, right? There's no one like Jehovah God. And, and so that's his name, but we find that he, <laughs> he's far from living up to his name. In fact, as we look at verses 2 through 4, we see this. 
he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, it also spoke in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. His mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Now, this is, this is a strange section of Scripture, is it not? I mean, I just talked about Michael and, Mike and his mom, but uh, this is a, a young man who steals from his mother. And it's not an insignificant amount of money. In fact, when it says 1,100 pieces of silver, uh, this, is a, this is a retirement type of amount of money, right? Uh, you'll see later on in the book that he's going to offer a Levite priest to come work for him for 10 pieces of silver for a year, right? So 10 pieces of silver would have been enough for a year, and here he steals 1,100 pieces of silver. That's a, that's a lot of years, right? 1,100 years, right? So... There was, and so when the money goes missing, mom's pretty upset, right? You'd be upset, right? If your entire retirement just disappeared, you'd be pretty angry. And so she curses the one who steals the, the, the money. And Mikey hears the curse. And it's not his conscience, right? It's not, it's not repentance here, but he hears the curse and he thinks, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you know, I, we don't know even what the curse is, but it, it's not good, right? Because it's enough to strike fear into Micah. And so Micah, for fear, not for fear of God, but for fear of mom's curse, returns the money. And mom's response is astounding. Blessed are you, my son. What do you do when your son looks at you and says, I'm the one who took your retirement? I stole this huge amount of money from you. What'd you say? Yeah, but she turns around and says, what a good boy. You, you gave me back the money. And, and I, I'll be honest, several years ago, I, I read this passage and I thought about preaching it for Mother's Day. Thankfully, the Lord kept me from doing that. Uh, this is a, a horrible Mother's Day passage. But it, it does paint a picture of what we see a lot in parenting today, do we not? My son can do no wrong. Yeah. He's, he's really a good boy. In spite of all the evidence, he's really a good boy, right? And, and so, you know, one of the worst things that we can do as parents is not call our children out on their sin, is to let them slide by whenever they do something wrong. And here it's even worse because he does something wrong and she commends him. Oh, you were so good to return my money that you stole. You know, and, and then she's going to, and, and, and we'll see here, you know, the, the, problem starts, the problem starts with the parents. Right? Because as we continue to read, <laughs> in fact, it, it says... When he restored the money to his mother in verse 4, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah, all right? So she said, I'm going to restore the money to you. I'm going to give it all to you, and, and, and I'm going to give it to the Lord, Jehovah, right, to make a, an idol. Now, here's the thing. How much money did he take? 1,100 pieces of silver. And she said, I'm going to give that all to the Lord so you can make an idol, which is, that's really bad in itself, right? However, she doesn't give it all to the Lord, right? She gives 200 pieces of silver. This sounds really familiar, does it not? If you're familiar with the book of Acts and the account of Ananias and Sapphira, right? They sell the land and they say, Lord, we're going to give it to you, but they keep back part of the price for themselves. That didn't end well for them. If you uh, don't know how that ended, then you can go to Acts chapter 5, and you can see. But I'll just tell you, they carried their bodies out of the house, all right? It didn't go well, right? Lying to the Lord and lying to the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and so we see this picture taking place. And 
There's a lot wrong with this picture. When you look, when you come to verse 5, it says the man Micah had a shrine. It means a house of God. <laughs> he made an ephod. That was meant for the priests, right? And a household gods. Those are idols and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. There's a, these are, there's a man and a woman here who, who express love and devotion to Jehovah, to Yahweh, to the covenant God. And yet, here we have the church of Micah, right? That's what's taking place. He's opened up his own center of worship, which is in opposition to the, the, the house, the tabernacle that's established in Shiloh, which yeah, someone might say, well, Shiloh, you know, that might have been too far for Micah to go. You know, this, was, this was the central place of worship for all of Israel. You know where Shiloh's at? It's in Ephraim. It, it's not like it was a long journey for them to go. What he's done is saying, you know what, I'm not going to worship in Shiloh. I'm going to worship right here. And if you want to worship, you can too. I've got my own priest, my own son. Very convenient, right? Now, he knows that that's probably not going to look, look quite right. What they should know is that the very God they say they worship and love, they're breaking his laws and his commands. Let me just remind you, right? Uh, I'll give you some reminders. In Exodus chapter 20, this is the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, that's pretty clear, pretty straightforward, and yet they say they love God, and yet they're going against the very commands that he, he gave them from the start. Remember the, the cursings that were, that were passed out on Mount Ebal? In, in, in Deuteronomy 27, verse 15, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Micah was a lot more concerned about his mom's curse than he was the curse of the Lord. He had a lot more fear of some superstitious words from his mother than the word of God. And really the true picture over Israel here is seen in verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Who was king in Israel? God was king in Israel, right? It was never meant for them to have a king. They were to be a theophany under the rule of God himself, but what do we see? There's no king in Israel. That's how they act, right? Similar to what we talked about this morning, right? About not lining ourselves under the lordship of Christ. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We get a true picture of this. <laughs> you know, they're right in their home. They don't leave their home and they manage to break seven out of the ten commandments in those few verses. Yeah, I mean, you're lying, coveting, stealing, idolatry. And we could just, you know, if you look at them, they're, they're all there. So Micah has set up for himself a house of worship. Well, there's something missing. And so we come to verse 7. It says, now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. Now, really, this, this Levite is the central character in, in chapter 17 and 18, and we don't know who he is, and that's really what Micah wants to know. Who are you, and where did you come from? And we learn a lot in a hurry. Uh, this, this Levite priest was dwelling in Bethlehem. Now, I don't have time to look at it tonight. I'm not sure I have time to get very far at all tonight. But yeah, Bethlehem was not one of the Levite cities that we see outlined. Right? This is a man who was not living underneath 
you know, God's word and God's plan. He was supposed to be a priest. God was the one who appointed where they would serve, where they would lead. I think as you go through the book of Judges, and I think why this appendix exists is because you're constantly going, where's the spiritual leadership? Where, where's the priest, right? Where's the, where's the, the it, it's, it's absent, right? Noticeably, as you're, as you're walking through the book of Judges, you don't see it. And so here's where it is. It's a mess. The Levitical priesthood is completely corrupt. This is a young man. Priests were not supposed to be ordained until they were over the age of 30. Very likely this man hadn't, re- hadn't reached that age yet. Mike is going to consider him one of his sons. Uh, priests were to serve where they were directed. This man's wandering around. Basically, he's a free agent. That's what we see here. He's looking for some place. Now, it's really a sad picture of the entire state of Israel because the, the Levites were supposed to be taken care of, right? God had put in place a system for his priests to be provided for. So it's really a picture of the entire state of the nation who had failed to provide for the priesthood. <coughs> but at the same time, what we see is a priest for hire. And so as this priest shows up at Micah's house, Micah sees an opportunity. There's something missing from my, from my church, from my house of worship. I don't really have a legitimate priest. My son's doing the job. He's not qualified. So an idea pops into his head. Micah said to him in verse 10, Stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year. Very generous of him. And a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. All right, now, the Levite should have said, well, what? I don't, this is not a place that I'm supposed to serve. God's the one who, but what does he hear? Oh, that, that sounds good, right? There's a, there's a good pay package, right? The, the, yeah, the, the, the benefits are nice. I'm in. Right? This is a picture of, of what we see in the New Testament of, of pastors who are serving for filthy lucre. They're willing to go wherever the money is. And that's what we see from this Levite priest. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and he was in his house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite priest. So Micah's got his own house of worship, his own ephod, his own idols, and now he's got his own Levite priest. He's got his own church. And he's breaking one command after another. And the irony is what? He believes that God, Jehovah, is going to bless him because he has a Levite priest, even though he's breaking all of God's other commands. Now, isn't that how religion works? We set the rules. We set the guidelines. And then God must conform to our rules and our standards. That's religion. Time and time again, God, if I do this, if I do X or I do ABC, then you've got to do X, Y, Z. That's, that's the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel today, right? If I push all the right buttons, then God's going to have to bless me, and he's going to have to give me this. Well, this is, this is Micah. He's a very opportunistic young man. <laughs> well, the story doesn't end there. We go into chapter 18, and, and so we have this picture, right? There's an opposing church in Ephraim. And here comes the tribe of Dan. <clears throat> in verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Now, it doesn't add there that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, but that's the picture we're going to see here. Right? The tribe of Dan is going to operate under their own authority. In those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. Now you have to understand, it's not that they didn't have an inheritance. Right? It's that they didn't claim their inheritance. If you go back to chapter 1, God had clearly outlined the borders that, that were supposed to go to each and every tribe. Dan knew exactly their portion of the inheritance. They didn't take it. They failed 
you, you, you see it in um, chapter, chapter 1 and verse 34. Okay, if you need to go back and just remind yourself. It, it says they, they, could not, they had to dwell in the hills because they couldn't, dwell, they couldn't run out the people of the, the, the valley of the plains. And so here we have a people who feel this place, feel like God has shortchanged them. In reality, they failed, to, they failed to walk in obedience to the Lord. They failed to trust him. They failed to see that they could overcome the enemy. So, they're going to search for an inheritance. It's not that they don't have one. It's that they feel like they've got gypped, right? They're discontented with what God has given them. So we start in verse 2. It says, so the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtel, to spy out the land and explore it. And they said to them, go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levi, and they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing here in this place? And what is your business here? <laughs> All right, so you know, they're leaving Dan, and they're looking, they're searching throughout the land for a place to call home, a place to set up you know, an inheritance. That's their mindset. And as they go, they come across Micah's bed and breakfast, right? This is really, you know, this is they're going to lodge there. And while they're there, they hear this Levite. And it stands out to them, not, not because he's not where, they're, not where he's supposed to be, not because he's not serving according to God's laws, but because he doesn't sound quite right. They hear him, and his accent is a little different than an Ephraimite should be. And so when they hear him, they say, why are you here? What are you doing here? They have a lot of questions. And so the Levite explains, beginning in verse 4. He says, he said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. That's not the way God had that worked out. And they said to him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. So the Levite explains, well, Micah's paying me to serve here in this church. And this is how it happened. And so they have another question. Well, yeah, if this is working out for Micah, maybe it'll work out for us. So they ask what? Can you tell us if our journey is blessed by the Lord? What are they asking? They want, they want this priest to overturn what God has already told them. God said, I've given you a land. I've given you inheritance. What are they doing? They're, ser they're searching for something else, something different, something better, right, than what God had given them. And so they say, priest, Tell us, is, is God going to bless our journey? Now, is God ever going to go against his word? No. He's already told them what they need to know. But Mike is going to tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> right? He's good at that, right? I mean, that's what priests for hire do, right? That's what pastors do today, right? Giving, right? speaking to those with itching ears. <laughs> Let me tell you what you want to hear. Well, that's what Micah does. He says what? Yeah, go for it. God's going to bless you. Now, where does he get that word? You know who's not mentioned? Jehovah. <laughs> we don't know. Did he, did he go? Did he go to the ephod? And, and the, you know, did, he, did he cast the herb and thumb in? We don't know what he did. But he comes back with an answer. Look at verses 7 through 10. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. They found a place, a nice place that was unprotected, that was going to be easy for them to take. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtael, their brothers said to them, what are your report? They said, arise, 
Let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. Now, this should, this should make your minds go back to another time when Israel sent spies out. Do you remember as they were entering, that, you know, that they were to enter the promised land, and Moses sent out 12 spies? They went and they looked at the land, and what did they find? A land that was plentiful, that had much to offer. They came back and they said, what, what do you have to report? And they said, the land's great. But the people are trouble. We, 10 of those spies said, we can't take the land. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go. God has given the land, right? Very different here. They come, these spies go, they, they see the land. They come back and they say, the land is good. And it's easy, right? This is, this is nothing. We can do this. God has given it to us. Let's take it. So, you know, the Danites are going to set out on their way to Laish. In verse 11, so 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtael and went up and encamped at kirjath Jerem in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanadon to this day. Behold, it is west of kirjath Jerem. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. So they're, they're going to cross, this is a, you know, Micah's house is probably at a pretty major crossroads in Ephraim. We don't know exactly where it's at. But what we do know is they're going to come back across the home of Micah. <laughs> and things get interesting from here. <clears throat> it says, The five men who were going to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now, therefore, consider what you will do. The spies say, uh, let me tell you about this house and what's in this house. What are you going to do? You know what they're essentially saying? <laughs> you can take this. <laughs> That's what they're saying. So here's, the, here's what they do. They turn aside and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate, and the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. <laughs> so the 600 soldiers distract the priest, and the five spies go, and they basically just empty Micah's house, right? That's what happens. And they said to, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 18, and when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet, put your hand on your mouth and come with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be the priest of the house of one man, or to be the priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods of the carved image, and went along with the people. Wow. At one point early on, it said that this man had become like a son to Micah. Well, that was a pretty loose relationship. A better deal came along, right? This Levi's going to move up to a mega church with a better package, and he's going to move on. Well, Obviously, Micah's devastated, and he's going to respond. So they turned and departed, verse 21, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. Why do you think they did that? Because they thought there might be retaliation. Put the little ones out front, keep the soldiers at the back, right? They knew Micah would be coming. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan, and they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, what is the matter with you that you come with such a company? Really? <laughs> they want to know, why are you coming after us? 
in verse 24, he said, you take my gods that I made? Now, that's ridiculous, is it not? <laughs> Just pause and think about that phrase for a little bit. <laughs> you took my gods that I made. How foolish is that? We are idol-making people, are we not? You took my gods that I made and go away? And what have I left? How then do you ask me what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. Essentially, they said, too bad. If, if you want to die here over your man-made idols, go ahead. Micah says, I think I'll go home. The, the sad picture here is, is Micah's response, is it not? What have I left? This is where idolatry always leads. It always leaves you wanting. It always leaves you short. Micah is, Mike is should be rejoicing. <laughs> if, this, if there was anything that was standing be, between him and, and, and the one true God, it was these idols in his home. They finally removed a barrier. <laughs> and he says what? I've got nothing. I have nothing. This is what our idols always do. This is what Jeremiah wrote about in, in chapter 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. <laughs> the chasing after idols will always leave you wanting. Now, I know, right? We don't, we don't have a lot of little statues and idols, but... John Calvin said our, our hearts are idol-making factories. We're, we're constantly looking to replace God with something, right? Something tangible. And all of those things, anything that, anything that takes the, the rightful place of God in our heart is an idol. And only you can know what that is. But I would encourage you to, to look at your heart tonight to examine yourself closely and, and ask yourself, what is it in my life that's standing between me and the Lord? And get rid of it. Get rid of it. Now, it's not difficult to kind of look at this and kind of see the irony and think, Micah really just got what he deserved, right? <laughs> the thief gets robbed. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. <laughs> Micah stole from his mom, used the money to, to form these idols. And now he's stolen from. <laughs> yeah. Isn't scripture true? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Be careful what you sow. So the church of Micah closes, but the church of Dan opens. <laughs> we see in verse 27, the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priests who belonged to him, and they came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from sight, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it, and they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel, but the name of the city was Laish at the first. Now, what we see here is the tribe of Dan traveling over 100 miles, again, the map's really helpful, 100 miles to the northeast to the city of Laish, right on the border of the promised land. It was nowhere near God's outline for their inheritance. In fact, if anything, it, it was in the inheritance of one of their other tribes, the tribe of Naphtali, which they didn't take because it still belonged to the Sidonians. And the Sidonians were a peaceful people a people of trade. And so they lived in the shelter and the comfort of the mountains and the safety, and they didn't worry about enemies. And here comes 
this warrior tribe of Dan and absolutely obliterates a peaceful people. They burn the city, they rename the city, and you know what? They set up the church, right? The, the, war, the place of worship. Now, here's the, the shocking identity of the priest here at the end of, of chapter 18. We see in verse 30, it says, The people of Dan set up the card image for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, I know your, your KJV says son of Manasseh there, um, but I, I believe we know very, we know without a doubt that Gershom was the son of Moses, right? And so, however, however it got translated as Manasseh, we're pretty sure that it's Moses we're talking about. Uh, many, many scholars believe that it got translated Manasseh just out of reverence for Moses. They didn't think the family of Moses should be, uh, should be, you know, looked down upon because of a, a Levite priest in the line of Moses who was making his living through idol worship. But this is the picture we see. A not very distant relative, relative from Moses is the Levite priest who's a free agent for hire, who's leading idolatrous worship in Israel. And it's a reminder of how quickly, how quickly things fall. I, I know you, you, you've kind of heard that idea, you know, what this generation celebrates, the next generation accepts, and the next generation embraces. Right? I mean, there's Moses loved the Lord. But his grandson was an idol worshiper and led idol worship. It could happen so quickly. I think as we finish the chapter here, we see the, the picture. It says, so they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. There was constant, constant competition with the true house of worship. There was constantly this this opposing house of worship, detracting, stealing away from the one true God. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I think there are several things we can take away, but you know, first and foremost, just the danger of idolatry. You know, the end of, of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. And so that would certainly be, you know, as we finish this chapter, that would be application number one. Uh, number two, I, I, as I look at Micah and I look at Dan, both of them were dissatisfied with what God had given them. God had established a house of worship. God had established a place of worship. And Micah said, that's not good enough. I want my own house of worship. God had given Dan an inheritance. And, and Dan said, that's not good enough. I want something better. And I fear that many times as the people of God, we are discontent with what God has given us. Paul said, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Oh, how we struggle in that area, do we not? Discontentment, a heart of discontentment is a dangerous thing to your spiritual condition. And then lastly, I, I don't think we can miss the significance of both the home and the church. We see the spiritual condition of the home in Micah's house. A sinful mother, a sinful son. But we also see the spiritual condition of the church. The Levitical priesthood in disarray. And when the home, the, when the home declines and the church declines, the nation suffers. And so as, as the people of God, we want to do what? We want to uphold highly the home and the church. We, wa we want to support in every way. So we want to see, as we talked about this morning with the baby dedication, we want to see 
godly men and women who are raising up godly children. And we want to see a, a church that is not giving people what they want to hear, but what they need to hear from the Word of God. So may this be true. May this be true of us, that we would see homes that follow God's plan, that we would be a church that shines brightly for His glory. Well, I've taken more than enough time tonight. My voice is shot. We're going to close in prayer.